Hi everybody, I just wanted to go over the four data sets that you guys used in this last lab really quickly and kind of draw out some of the points that I was hoping everybody would capture. Some of it is pretty detailed information that I've just learned from teaching this for so many years, um, but I think it's really inf interesting information and should help you um, take a second look at the data that you're using when you run certain analyses or are just creating maps for visualization at the very least. So you were comparing uh, a LiDAR data set, 2 meter LiDAR, a 5 meter autocorrelated data set, 10 meter derived from the USGS, the NED, National Elevation uh, Data, and then a 30 meter data set, which was actually a construction of the Utah AGRC from the 10 meter. Um, that, I'm not sure where I even found out that information over the years, but I wouldn't expect you to know that, but I'll talk about that in just a second. Um, hopefully it was pretty clear to you the differences, especially between the LiDAR and the 5 meter data. 5 meter is really high, um, good resolution, a small cell size, and we should be able to discern really fine features. But I'm hoping that you saw this kind of bubbly, messy surface and were able to compare uh, how erroneous that seemed relative to the 10 meter and the 2 meter. The LiDAR and the 10 meter data were both constructed in very different ways. Hopefully you understand now that LiDAR is you know, just a reflected laser beam where we take an intensity of a return and can either create a bare earth elevation model or a first return elevation model which looks more something like this. This is a you know, typical landscape with a channel running through it and then vegetation. So this is the laser bouncing off the first return things, which is, you know, the top of vegetation, top of trees, tops of cars, tops of people's heads, etc. Um, Post-processing, we have to go through and strip that stuff off, um, get rid of the vegetation, interpolate between known points to smooth out, um, smooth out features. Also, um, bridges, um, any obstructions to a channel have to be removed. Um, this is an example of raw survey data where a field crew went out with a total station and um, uh, um, captured very high point densities around features of interest like these beaver dams crossing a channel. They were also able to stand in the channel bed and get the channel bottom um, elevations, whereas LIDAR is reflected off the water surface or is absorbed by the water and we don't get a clear read of the, um, the channel bed. Um, so that's kind of just guessed at. And these kinds of obstructive features, whether it's a bridge, an overpass, or a beaver dam, um, or just large woody debris, this stuff has to actually be manually stripped from the LiDAR DEM so that flow can be modeled on the landscape. So uh, um, that's just a couple of points I want to make about the LiDAR. We do consider it you know, the truest, most accurate data that we usually can acquire for a landscape, but it does have a lot of limitations. Um, like uh, penetrating water and having um, things that might, features that might be of interest actually removed from it. Um, yeah, so 2 meter, 10 meter end up looking very similar. The 10 meter data is an interpolated process pulled from contour maps. So the USGS in its most basic form takes a contour map and either manually digitizes the contour lines and then interpolates between them and builds an elevation, a digital elevation surface or um, they have computer programs, obviously, that can read the contour lines and then interpolate between them. Where better information exists, such as LiDAR, we can inform the 10 meter uh, data sets and improve them, you know, whenever possible. Um, but you can see that even though these are created from such different processes, they're very, very similar. This little ravine feature, for example, shows up really nicely. Um, a lot of the surp surface bubbles and chunks don't appear in the 10 meter or the two meter. This is erroneous stuff, vegetation, um, things that the autocorrelation process just can't rectify. Um, okay, so about that, the way the autocorrelated data is constructed is using a stereo, like stereoscopic aerial images. So a lot of you noticed um, in the lit that they um, flew NAEP imagery back in, I think, 2006. And NAEP imagery is leaf on aerial images, so it's kind of an agricultural um, data set. But leaf on, I think you can probably imagine, already creates a lot of issues for us. Uh, known data points are taken and used um, to kind of pin down the surface, and then um, between these stereoscopic images, um, an interpolated surface is created 
um, between the known points and then these images. But the leaf on, I think, is a big thing to take into consideration. It's where we get a lot of this surface garble. Um, so there are a lot of warnings that come with using this autocorrelated DEM set. Um, it does, I think, come in two meter as well, but it's always going to be um, probably a better bet to either stick with your 10 meter or two meter if you're doing actual analysis of the surface versus just visualization. Um, this works fine for just, uh, you know, visualizing areas. The 30 meter, I'm hoping that you guys noticed this weird corduroy effect, these stripes. Um, and I don't know that you would have noticed this necessarily, but there's an offset here. So the way this um, four data frame image was set up, I, it's, pretty, it's pretty hard to see, but if you look carefully, these ridges here are all set in the exact same place, but this one's actually offset. And it's offset by almost 60 meters, which is kind of a big deal for data. And this was a result of a resampling. The Utah EHRC took the 10 meter NED and resampled it to make a bigger cell size um, for smaller, you know, um, smaller, false, smaller file sizes overall, 30 meter cell size. But the resampling was done a little bit incorrectly and they uh, ended up with this spatial offset and this kind of striping pattern that normally um, shouldn't appear. If you redid the resample yourself from a 10 meter to a 30 meter and set your environments correctly, you could do away with this um, kind of corduroy pattern. So it's, I continue to use this for this lab because this is a very common error to see in DEM data, some kind of striping pattern, and it just means you have to take another look at it. If you resampled it or processed it somehow, just do it again and try and figure out what's going on there. I can't give you specifics because it's always going to be a different um, work flow that creates something like this, but that's basically the long and short of it. Um, a lot of you did a good job. This is from one of your works, one of your um, classmates' works, focusing in on this lake. Um, I think it's interesting to note that the LIDAR can pick up this little dam, um, and that's okay that that's there because it is an obstruction in the surface and it does prevent flow. Um, that's the reason it's left there. It doesn't show up in the 5 meter data set. It's pretty hard to see in the 10. Um, but again, you know, LiDAR doesn't penetrate water surfaces and we just end up getting um, kind of a false, a false surface here. People have to do the post-processing, like I said, and so they go in and, and try and identify features like this and create a flat surface where they can. Um, but that's, that's it for these four data sets. Um, I think the take-home message is you really need to know what you're doing. You really need to know what you're working with. All DEMs are not the same. They aren't created the same way. They aren't sourcing the same original data. Um, and you can run into some problems if you're using something. You can't just base it on the resolution. You really have to understand how these things are created and be, be aware of um, offset issues and pattern issues that could really mess up your, your analyses. If you have questions, let me know. Thanks.